complicated, but we'll try to figure it out tonight. The Dan York State of Mind program is brought to you at part by Lookout Rhode Island and Taco Comfort Solutions. The Convention Center Authority has been in the news in a way that I'm sure they're very uncomfortable with. This has not been a, an easy saga for it, and we shall describe the situation through the executive director of it tonight as we chronicle, at least as much as we can, the story of the Speaker of the House reportedly putting a little bit too much pressure on them in the ensuing investigation. Stay with us for that. Great to have you aboard. Um, we're going to hustle through some important things, and I'm going to forego the usual network package, but a couple of headlines here. Uh, it's historic. We will, uh, we will do some programming on this next week, no doubt. We've done so much on it, but the Senate acquitting Donald Trump was the most expected news event that we've had in a long time. What was not expected was this, Mitt Romney, uh, offering his conviction vote on impeachment article number one. Gut check, heartfelt, courageous, all those things, everyone has said so. Of course, he got his head handed to him today by the President of the United States, who, as I look at the clock at 127 here this afternoon, is still talking, or, or was when we just about started, over an hour. You think maybe, you think maybe, you hope sort of that based on the turn of events, that somebody would get in his ear, someone would be able to say, all right, Mr. President, this is time to win the 2020 election. See if we can step up higher. Not a chance. This was one of the milder moments. Did nothing wrong. Did nothing wrong. I've done things wrong in my life, I will admit. <laughs> Not purposely, but I've done things wrong. But this is what the end result is. Uh, a lot of terms like exonerated being thrown around as well. There's nothing exonerating about the acquittal. Okay, so uh, I'm not going to make a speech about it. He did. Let it sit where it is. It's uncanny. There are no more superlative adjectives to describe the President of the United States based on his performance today. It's just something that some of you are going to thrive and enjoy on, and I think you need therapy if you do, honestly. Uh, and the rest of us are just going to have to sit here and hope that it gets better. Keep looking at your 401k, that's all I can say. Now, a guy who thinks he can take him out, of course, politically, electorally, is uh, Mike Bloomberg, the former New York City mayor, who came to one of his old allies yesterday and got his first gubernatorial endorsement. Look. Global leader in the fight against climate change. <laughs> Democratic presidential hopeful Mike Bloomberg in Rhode Island Wednesday, securing his first endorsement from any governor in the country. Mike Bloomberg is everything President Trump isn't. Rhode Island Governor Gina Raimondo making it official, saying she sees Bloomberg as her party's best hope and praising his policies on climate change and gun control. For me, it's an easy decision. I spoke with Raimondo and Bloomberg after the event. Uh, Mike's a friend. He has an unbelievable track record of delivering. The 77-year-old billionaire argues other Democratic candidates don't have their eye on the ball. I'm running against Donald Trump. They're running against each other. And my polls are going up and their polls are going down. If I were them, I'd change their strategies. Donald Trump's the wrong guy for the job, and we've got to do something about it. What about the concerns among some in the more moderate wing of the Democratic Party who say, you know, your campaign is harming people like Joe Biden, maybe even Pete Buttigieg now, because you do have, you can command a lot of attention. What, what, what I miss, so what, why am I not as important to this country? I've been an American for longer than uh, Mayor Pete has. I've been an American for longer than Joe Biden has. Um, I have a right to run as well. Bloomberg spoke just hours after the president delivered his State of the Union speech, touting strong job numbers and a growing economy. Are voters wrong to be relatively pleased with where things are? In every uh, period in office, there's some good times and bad times. And yes, there are a lot of things that are going right, but there are an awful lot of things going wrong. A lot of Rhode Islanders are trying to figure out what Gina Raimondo's role in this whole thing will be. Significant. Uh, she is a prominent national Democratic figure. She has more juice outside the state than she does inside the state. Uh, interestingly enough, she's the former chair of the Governor's Association. She is somebody that is, 
uh, uh, people think Bloomberg might flirt with to partner up his vice president uh, nominee if by some chance he got through this whole process or bought his way through this entire process. Uh, I'm not so sure. Rhode Island doesn't bring anything in middle America, and he's going to need somebody in middle, middle America. Amy Klobuchar, maybe, if, if she can't get it done. Um, but it's going to be fascinating. And while I really want to see people contribute to candidates, because it's currency, it's the way the First Amendment ought to exercise itself inside the political dynamic, uh, Mike Bloomberg might very well be the billionaire that Donald Trump never wants to face. But there's a long road to hoe and so much confusion up until Super Tuesday when he's going to make his move. It's going to be a, it's a crapshoot at best, but it's part of the saga in 2020, no doubt. All right, let's go to the, the, the story of the day. It's hard to pick this thing up in the middle, but we will. Headline here, Convention Center Audit, right? This is the first story that Target 12 brought to you that explained that the Auditor General, who works for the General Assembly, uh, was directed by the Speaker of the House to audit the Convention Center. Now, the Convention Center has been under fire from Republicans uh, for quite some time. Uh, the assumption is that nobody ever watches the store at the Convention Center, that the thing is so far out of whack and so much of a money loser that it's a complete waste and a morass of, you know, patronage dump. Others, uh, like me, might say, you know what, fiscal discipline is a good idea. Uh, but these kinds of facilities are generally lost leaders for an economy. Many of them across the country don't make money on the exact bottom line and aren't designed to. But they sure bring a lot of people into the community and they do inspire a lot of business profit. Um, somewhere in the middle might be where you stand. But an audit ordered by the Speaker of the House out of the blue was intriguing, right? So Target 12 came up with that, and then what happened was the state representative on the organization that no one ever knew about and now does, the Joint Community, uh, Commi uh, Committee on Legislative Services, the five-member board of, of, of high elected officials in the General Assembly that comprise the operating arm of the General Assembly, cried foul and said, hey, you didn't ask me about this audit, and sued the speaker, which then caused the Convention Center Authority, next headline, to say, you know what? Uh, I think they're right, meaning the Republicans on this. There wasn't a formal vote, so we're not going to comply with the audit. Uh, now, not moments later, inside the news cycle, the convention center executives, uh, including my guest tonight, wrote a letter to the state police asking this headline for some help to kind of clarify what went on there because of all the heat in the rumor and conversation kitchen inside the authority about the speaker ordering this audit, right? Okay, now, the speaker then, next headline, cancels the audit based on the heat and says, eh, maybe I did the wrong thing, but this is the way we've been operating the place the entire time. My, uh, my intentions were good, that's fine. Uh, and then we have the convention center employee departure, which is actually at the core beginning of this story, meaning it seems that the speaker's interest in the Convention Center Authority, come on back to me, uh, was in response to a, a personal ally, political and personal ally, having an employee problem. And we'll discuss that with our, our guest coming on. But it seems like his motive was not necessarily about systemic financial discipline and austerity and all of that, but it was about one of his guys. And that's where it gets really kind of murky. And then we had this kind of anomaly where the State House dumpster was investigated because the tension is so high at the State House right now, that office that houses the JCLS was actually uh, the, uh, renovated. There was a reported mold problem, so black that it had to be emergency lies responded to and cleaned up. And they dump stuff in the dumpster, but people see stuff going in the dumpster from the office and they call the cops. The cops come, state police, and they say, no. by the way, I don't think anybody would shred any important material, like documents, uh, I'm so, or dump them in the dumpster. You'd probably shred them first, right? But that's kind of the heat in the kitchen, and an example of some of the turmoil and the turbulence going on. And then we see that the grand jury, in fact, has actually subpoenaed a handful of people, both inside, final headline, Kemp, I know you're following along here. The, uh, the final headline is, is that the grand jury is investigating, uh, no doubt, which tells you that the attorney general has interest in this case. And there are handfuls of people, both inside the authority and out, that have been called to the grand jury or will be. 
Yeah? What do you think? That was about a month. Right? Yep. Jim McCarville is the, is the boss, the executive director, uh, the paid leader of the Convention Center Authority. We'll, we'll dig into this in segments two and three. What's your 30-second summary of, of what's going on right now? Uh, right now, you know, as you Did know... Did I get anything wrong, by the way? Uh, no, you, you got it. It, you're, it's you're hard to track this. Start story. to finish, you're 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 pretty much there. I mean, there's a lot of um, you know issues on in the inside. So we we get a request for an audit. Um, my immediate response was, okay, let's go. And I got in touch with um, the auditor general, and we had a good planning meeting. Um, um, approximately a week after we got the request. You know, it's probably ridiculous for me, I do this with most of my guests, to say, all right, give me a 30-second uh, executive summary and then we'll dig in. It's hard to do that. You're going to dig in, so why don't we just pause, we'll come back, and we'll start digging into what Jim can tell us about what went on, what goes on, and what's going to happen. Stay with us. So even though I gave you a big recap, and if you missed the beginning of the show, how dare you? You've got an appointment here at 7.30 on, you know, on weeknights and midnight. Um, Remember, if you missed any of the show, foxprovidence.com or the Facebook or Twitter pages that we put out. But here is the latest from Tim White in Target 12 on the saga. Target 12 has learned detectives from the Rhode Island State Police interviewed veteran Convention Center Authority board member Paul McDonald on Tuesday. On Newsmakers earlier this month, House Speaker Nicholas Mattiello confirmed he discussed the personnel investigation into his friend and Convention Center Director of Security James Demers with someone connected to the Convention Center. I inquired of one person and I was told that it was basically a personnel matter and I had no other involvement with that. Target 12 has learned that person was McDonald and the conversation was described right, as tense. <laughs> Mattiello has repeatedly denied the audit was in retaliation for the personnel investigation into Demers. He has right, since no rescinded the audit so after Target 12 brought so the situation to light. No. The state police also interviewed Convention Center Chairman James McCarville Tuesday. Both McDonald and McCarville have not returned a call for comment. As Target 12 previously reported, state law says performance audits, like the one Mattiello ordered, require a majority vote from the Joint Committee on Legislative Services, or JCLS, the administrative arm of the General Assembly. But other members of the JCLS tell us that vote never happened. Last week, the head of the Convention Center's board told Target 12 they were stunned when they received the audit. We realize that there's a five-person committee that makes that decision, and only one person made it. So we were quite upset about it. That is Bernie Bonanno, who is the uh, chair of, of the board. Um, you talked to the state police, and you have been subpoenaed to the grand jury, correct? Yes. So, um, and by the way, the rules are there. I mean, anybody who's uh, subpoenaed can talk about it publicly, but the attorney general will never admit it's formally going on. Uh, it's kind of the way the whole thing goes. <sighs> this, this, let's get your, your, your kind of summary judgment up front, then we'll work our way back. Is it your feeling that this audit was ordered for the wrong reason? I think the convergence of events and the timing and everything would lead you to believe that. I mean, we, we knew we had a performance audit scheduled for 2020, but that was through the Bureau of Audits. The last one we had was in 2016. So we knew we were up. So it wasn't really a surprise when I got it. I just didn't look at the You're internally source. reviewed on a regular basis financially. Yes, every month. Every month. You have outside accounting firms to, to do this stuff. Yes, we do. Um, it's long been rumored that the convention center itself, the authority is just a small organization. You just have a couple of employees, right? Correct. Reporting to the board, regulating the entire thing, which is the convention center itself. It's the, um, it's the Dunkin' Donuts. It's VET, the VET. Right, the three facilities. And right? the new one, the new uh, garage is going to open. And the new garage, uh, which is probably the only thing that on, on paper makes money, right? The, the garages make money. The garages make money. Yes. Yeah, they sure do. Uh, my goodness. Um, put to bed or comment at least on this notion that it's a cesspool of, of you know, job dumping and, and it bleeds, you know, gushing financial blood and is completely out of control. Thank you for the opportunity. Um, Number one, it, it, it's not it's not a business that makes money on a, on its own, as you brought out in the, in the open. It, it, convention centers are basically a loss leader. Now, components of your business are likely to reduce 
your need for any kind of subsidy or debt service payment, like your food and beverage operations, things like parking. So we have all that. But there's a lot of concentrated effort that goes into not only containing expense, but we really are about generating activity. We're really about getting visitors. We want new money into the, into the community, into the state. And to do that, you have to play at a high level, and you have to be service-oriented, and they, people have to come to a, a nice facility and get first-class treatment. And at the same time, you're in an enormously competitive business. When I started in this business, there were probably two dozen significant convention centers in the United States. Now there's probably about 250. Mm. So it's everybody understands the value of those visitors. Everybody understands that a convention center, arena complex, civic center complex can add vibrancy and life to your city. So you're constantly competing with them as well. Um, we have low turnover on our, on our staff. People have well, let's talk about the model. You just so you understand, you've got the convention center business when you say you bring in you, you bring in the big meetings and the, and the expositions, uh, the home shows, the comic cons, you know that yeah. whole thing. You got the dunk that's got two major tenants in PC and the P Bruins, and then you try to bring in some shows. You got the vet that brings in the shows, and you got the garage that uh, you know prints the money because um, uh, parking downtown is awful. So. Give me, give me your honest engine answer as to what your competitive position is with those three components. Okay, the, the, the VETS is very good theater for its size. It's 1,900 seats. It does tremendous. It has a great um, prime tenant in the Rhode Island Philharmonic. Uh, and with the people from PPAC over there running it day to day, uh, P professional facilities management, the programming is now at least three times what it was when we took it over. You farmed out the professional management of this thing. Yes. So what do you do? Do you book shows, or do you, or, or you watch these guys book shows? It's in that particular at the vets. I'm a little more involved, but only on a uh, approval basis. So you're watching the private management company operate the three facilities. They report to you, and you're trying to keep the pressure on to, to to get as much business as possible. You know, at some juncture when this thing clears, we should just come back and talk about the business of the convention center in a much more comprehensive fashion because I find it fascinating. It's an economic model that um, is different from city to city, but uh, I agree with you. You agree with me. I, I think this notion that 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 that, that authority uh, demands. Uh, that we should demand profitability from that authority, I think, is a misnomer. The question is, how many employees there are patronage employees, or, or uh, and, and is that an unhealthy situation? I don't think there's many. Well, how many uh, employees in general does the does the convention uh, the, do, the, do the four facilities employ? If I was, yeah, uh, probably more or less full timers. It's probably about 150, 100 to 150. Okay. But now overall, the, through the course of the year, you want to count banquet servers and stagehands and laborers who work on trade shows, and uh, it's probably well over 1,000, 1,500 maybe. All right. It's a place where, you can, where, where, where patronage occurs. By the way, patronage is not illegal. Some of it is unruly, and some of it is unnecessary, and some of it's bad form. But you've got to find people to do jobs, right? You, you need people that are committed. Yeah. Now, when we come back, we'll talk about what the acute investigation catalyst is and try to figure this thing out in four minutes. Stay with me. James McCarville is the executive director of the Convention Center Authority. All right, let, let's get down to it. You had a, there was a personnel issue inside the, the Convention Center Authority. Your, your director of security, a former state policeman, uh, seemingly had a tryst with the, the assistant general manager. Um, are both dismissed at this point? As far as I know. Okay. Um, do you believe that that discipline that he was he was under was cause of concern for the Speaker of the House? Could have been. Uh, is it true that the Speaker of the House sought out Mr. McDonald, uh, the uh, the senior uh, guy on, on the authority uh, board and a, a, a labor lobbyist, and uh, asked him to deliver a message uh, to you guys about uh, cleaning that thing up, or there would be an anima delivered? Don't know. Did you ever speak to Mr. McDonald directly? I haven't. You have I usually would speak to him. Uh, the last time I spoke to him was at our board meeting. Did he deliver the message reportedly to somebody else other than you at the it's convention center? Possible. I know what, what you do. So you're going to tell that to the grand jury next week? I will. 
So what is so so? Well, do you believe that the that the that the speaker in some way communicated pressure to your organization? It's possible, but I'm not a witness to that. You're not a witness to that. Do you know if somebody is a witness to that? I do not know. So why are we under the impression that it happened? Uh, it was in the paper. You know, again, I'm not. I'm not trying hmm. to be cute. And I'm not talking I, to your prosecutor, but the, you I, know, people are trying to figure out whether or not it's true that Nick Mattiello put the phone on the authority because this guy was jammed up. Yeah, it's. Um, that was not presented to me that way, to me that way. But Remember you did say the at the beginning that you ASM think that the, you, do, you do think. What's that? Remember the authority and ASM Global, which is the management company, which is who those guys work for. We're two separate entities, so we wouldn't have. That, that's not our employee anyway. So you're suggesting maybe ASM is the recipient of this message? Possibly. But did they communicate to you that they got that message? Not that I can recall. I would recall. So was this controversy a surprise to you? Um, not once I realized we, we were being called for a specific audit that we had the other audit was then announced like a week later so I knew they weren't the same audit um, and then there was comments a lot of comments you know making uh, inside the authority and I think more outside I think more general comments in the media and so forth about you know we need to take a look at this and um, people have said bad things about the authority for 20 years and you know, it's time to take a look at it. And that, that's what upset me. That's where I feel threatened in the sense that the authority, you know, as I said in an earlier piece, it's a really competitive business. It's a really competitive business. And there's millions and millions of dollars at stake. This story's it, harming your competitive position. It could, it could definitely hurt our competitive position out in the, you know, the greater world, you know, Virginia and Washington, D.C., and where all these association people are from, and Chicago and Denver, and wherever else we're selling. It, believe it or not, I mean, even the very first story was in the San Francisco Chronicle. Gotcha. All right. Uh, those two employees are no longer in the employ, correct? That is correct. And uh, you move onward from there. So to some, I have 30 seconds, you'll tell them what you know. I'm guessing ASM management then is going to have to be in, in, interviewed. Do you know if they've been interviewed? I can tell you that... Um, Larry Lepore, who works for ASM, is the GM. He's been called. He's been subpoenaed. Uh, Bob Lauro, also He's from called. ASM. It. And then Paul from the board, Paul McDonald, gotcha. and then myself. Those are the only ones I know about. I think I understand the track. All right, well, listen, uh, we'll keep in touch with you on this. I appreciate your participating, and someday we'll just talk shop about the, the business of entertainment and whether, you know, how that works. Really love to. All right, Jim, thank you very much. Final word when we come back. As this saga of the Convention Center Authority and the Speaker's potential or alleged pressure on it for an audit evolves and the subpoenas and the grand jury stuff comes in, there's a bigger picture conversation about how the General Assembly works. And tomorrow night, Gary Sass, the former Director of Administration and leadership guy from Bryant, will come in here with his theories on how that ought to be cleaned up. All right, so you have a good night. We'll talk to you tomorrow. Thanks for tuning in. See ya.